Welcome to Desert Island Discs. And today we have another colleague from the company in Norwich here called Each Moment. And that is Johnny Briggs. Hello, Johnny. Hello. Johnny, tell me what you do at Each Moment and what you enjoy most about the job. Um, I work in AV, audiovisual. I am the, the head of the department and I've been here for about two and a half years. Just doing all sorts. Started with recording and editing and now I'm kind of just overseeing the day-to-day of the department and um, my favourite bit of the job is speaking to customers you know looking at all these exciting memories that we get through and you know see what see what we've unlocked for them it's really really interesting. You use the word memories Um, now it's interesting that not only do you work in a position where you're making sure that people's memories continue from tape from film from audio from photographs but that's also what we're doing here today with Desert Island Discs because I'm hoping that quite a few of your tracks that you've got and your time on the island is going to be spent actually thinking about uh, some of those memories that perhaps uh, you know you've had in the past Mm. Um, do you think much of your music does put you back in a certain time or are they all sort of fairly modern tracks that don't really have any memories attached what what, what, how have you picked your your music um the music or my track selections definitely come down to what i enjoy listening to most and i think when i say that i mean it's a track that puts me back in a place that i remember well or i have fond memories of a lot of these tracks i wouldn't say (laughs) <laughs> you know don't don't make me extremely emotional but i think they definitely tap into this emotional side of my psyche so to speak and i, I do feel like they put me in a, a nice time and space that i remember well okay so your first track is a band that i hadn't heard of before who hailed from australia i understand tame impala that's correct yeah and what's the track the track is alter ego by tame impala off their first album inner speaker released in 2010 and um, it's just a brilliant mix of psych rock, 60s goodness. Okay, and how did you come to hear it? I came across Tame Impala uh, my first year of university. I remember it really, really well. I listened to her 2015 album Currents, which was quite big at the time, that had released the year I'd, I'd started at university. And um, a lot of my friends were, were into a similar kind of music as me, and we listened to Currents together and went back through all their other albums. And I, I have really fond memories of of listening to Inner Speaker in particular and that one really just resonating well with me. I really enjoyed the way it sounded, the way it was mixed, the songwriting, everything about it was 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 brilliant.
so Alter Ego by Tame Impala. Uh, you were talking about that you appreciate the mix on that. Now, I know that you uh, do music, uh, obviously you do sound, so um, in terms of actually appreciating the sounds and what goes into it, you have experience of that yourself. Mm. Yeah, from a young age I've, I've played electric guitar and I've tried to play bass and uh, drums, not as well as other people, unfortunately. But along with that, I've, I've played in bands since high school, and I'm still playing a band now with, with a few friends and my partner. And um, I think throughout those bands, I've always been a part of doing quite a lot of DIY recording ourselves and setting up at home and setting up in studio spaces without the help of a, a traditional engineer and producer and, and recording things ourselves for demos and even releases that we've, we've put out in the past. I think along with that, I'm not saying I'm an expert by any means, but I feel like I have a good ear for what sounds good and what sounds bad. But I think the most important thing is I just have an ear for what I like the sound of the most. My go-to sound, particularly you know when I'm playing my instrument with my guitar, electric guitar is obviously so heavily influenced sound-wise by effects pedals, and I think that's what I've always really loved is just the sound of a reverb pedal, sound of a delay pedal or particularly on this track, there's obviously a heavy use of uh, small stone uh, phaser, um, which I've got myself, and it's just a, it's just an effect you can't get out of any other pedal, and I've got a really good ear for it, and I really love the way it sounds. Um, it's brilliant. Is it similar to the sort of the, uh, the, the uh, 60s kind of phasing that you did uh, with analogue tape, with changing the speed uh, between the tracks? It is like that. I guess it doesn't sound as good as that, I'd say, unfortunately. No. Ichiku Park comes to mind. There's a lot of phasing in that track. Right, okay. Uh, small phases. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it's like that. It's, it's just a, a very slimmed down effect in this tiny little metal box, which, you know, makes a big difference with with with, with my guitar and I like the way it sounds. So. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, The War on Drugs is another band now that we're going to hear from. Mm-hmm. Harmonious Dream is the track. Mm-hmm. Again, is, is, has this got a similar style to some of the, the other tracks that you've got, or, or is this a, a departure from that? Um, this is a, a bit of a departure, I'd say. It's it's the same from an instrumental perspective. You know, you've got your band set up, drums, bass, guitars. But this is more keys heavy. Uh, there's a lot more going on synth-wise and, and piano-wise in the background that I think the more I've listened to the music and the more I've played and the more I've gone to gigs, etc., and listened to records, I've appreciated piano more and more, and I really feel like this is a really solid foundation on this track. And this band, every song they put out is just a, a big anthem, basically. They, you know, they're you always five minutes plus, and they're very emotional tracks, um, very emotive singing and the guitar and everything just sits perfectly emotionally it just sounds brilliant and it sounds like it fits a large stage and this is what this band do you know i think i saw them recently a few months ago in halifax at the peace hall which is an amazing venue for a concert and um or i should say a big a big rock gig that's more what it was like it started off like a traditional concert but it got very rock and roll towards the end which i didn't expect from this band but this track sounded great live. Uh, the band translated all their records across really, really well. And I really thoroughly enjoyed it, and I would definitely want to see them again. And it puts them up there currently as one of my favourite bands. I think that's why it's made it onto this bag of records with me on this desert island.
So, Johnny, as I understand it, um, your parents are Scottish and you were brought up in Scotland for a bit before moving this way? So, yeah, my mum is uh, 100% Scottish and my dad's got a bit of Scottish in the family. So I always have this idea that I'm 75% Scottish. So I'm definitely (laughs) more Scottish than I am English, which I am really, really proud of. And although I was born in Stirling and lived there for all of about two or three weeks before we moved to Somerset to follow my dad's work. Right. I would move there in a heartbeat, I think, and I would like to go there a lot more and walk and get about. We've, I've been to Edinburgh and Glasgow a few times, and I've got family that live in Falkirk near Glasgow. The only thing I am really upset about is I, I don't have the accent, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> you've, you've, um, yeah, yeah you've, got, you've got the posh Scottish. Well, in fact, I can't hear any, any, any Scottish in you, but, but you, no, you, 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 would, you, would, you, would, you would like would to. I, I, yeah. I think I would like to, to get a bit of the accent back, and I do feel like the further I go up north, I do. <laughs> I like to think that my accent changes, but it probably doesn't whatsoever. But yeah, it's a nice part of the world, and I'm very proud to be from a place like that, and I'm really close with my family and my mum and her parents that lived in Scotland all their lives before they moved away to sunny Spain which is quite the most Scottish thing you can possibly do <laughs> things, to get a little bit of sun in, in their retirement but yeah I'll just very quickly add that I love everything about Scotland from nature to especially the food side of things I think I get my guilty eating habits from being I always joke that it's the Scottish boy inside me that really likes eating deep fried I was going to say deep food. fried Mars bars <laughs> haggis yeah, yeah I really like haggis I love deep fried Mars bars wash it down with some iron brew exactly <laughs> iron brew is probably my favourite drink so so yeah that's definitely it is funny definitely actually I mean I mean, um, having having been to Edinburgh Station mm. um, you do notice that when you go to one of these eateries I always thought it was the stereotypical kind of um, mm. thing that you know that, that us English always imagined but actually when you get there and you get to the stand there's your deep fried Mars bar there's all the 
iron brew stacked at the back. It is actually for real. <laughs> yeah, completely. And I have really good memories of that as a kid because I used to obviously go up to Scotland a lot when I was when I was younger, especially when my grandparents lived there. And I used to see my aunties a lot. So I've got really fond memories of going to a chip shop and getting deep fried this and that with a you know with a little can of iron brew on the side. Yeah. It's a comfort Ooh. food. <laughs> so if you sign up to Duolingo then you're not going to do French or German or Spanish you're going to do Scottish. <laughs> no, I reckon if there's if there's some kind of uh I don't know Glaswegian dialect course I can do I'll probably take that. <laughs> Are you not going to just watch Rav Sinez bit over and over? No, or or I could read train spotting apparently that's written in in a in a specific dialect which is apparently very hard to digest i've never given it a go no i know my partner has a copy but um oh but yeah i could see that i don't think you've actually got any scottish tracks in your selection have you i haven't um no. which was actually quite difficult i can drop an honorable mention in, in at this stage yeah and it would be that one of my all-time favorite bands especially when i was growing up was biffy clyro oh um simon neil the front man was always my idol growing up he's got like long hair he plays a lovely looking Fender Stratocaster and he's got a big wall of amps behind him and all the records that he made with his bands were always amazing and they were very, very heavy and that's what I used to be into when I was younger. My sound is, my taste and sound that I play with my band has definitely mellowed out but I still have this appreciation for, mm. for all their old records. I think it didn't make it in because it's, it doesn't really fit in with my idea of what I listen to every day basically, so yeah. Yeah. So to another Australian band now, with quite a mouthful of a name, <laughs> Rolling Blackout's Coastal Fever. Mm. Um, the track is An Air Conditioned Man. Yeah, that's the one. Rolling Blackout's Coastal Fever. Yeah, it is a mouthful. <laughs> um, they usually uh, abbreviate the C and the F at the end. They go Rolling Blackout's C dot F, but ah. the whole band name sounds a lot better. This particular track is off uh, an album called Hope Downs. I really, really, really like this band. I always used to love them when I was um, kind of at uni and, and getting into loads of other records. And um, I think in particular with this song, it evokes really, really good memories of meeting my partner Flo at the time in 2018. But when we first met, we mentioned this band and I was really, really excited to speak to her about it because I was like, obviously, they're not the biggest band in the world. They're quite a small Australian band. They're on a big label, Sub Pop, but... Nirvana used to be on, etc. In, in in the uh, late 80s, early 90s. But yeah, this is a really, really good track. It's really snappy. It's really poppy. It's just really happy-go-lucky.
So from a small Australian band to a band that I'm sure everybody in the whole world has heard of, uh, a very big band, the Beastie Boys. That's the one, yeah. We said that my second track was a bit of a departure from, from the rest of the list, but this is definitely one that jumps right off and right at you when you read it written down or when you listen to it because it is completely different. So why this Beastie Boys track compared with all the others? I it, Again, it evokes a really, really good memory. That's why it made it straight onto the list. It was when I was at, at college and we had a camping trip with some friends and I remember we'd got to this really, really beautiful spot in Norfolk somewhere and we'd we'd showed up and we got dropped off with all our tents and all our um, other paraphernalia at the time, uh, including my first can of <laughs> beer I probably had. Of it. Oh, right. <laughs> um, but yeah. Um, so you left the iron brew behind this time. I left the iron brew behind for something a little bit tastier. Um, and I remember my friend was like, have you heard of the Beastie Boys? And I was like, no. My, my, my mate Jacob at the time I used to play in a band with. If he ever hears this, he'll be very chuffed because this song made a really lasting impression on me because I just love how gritty it is and how rhythmic it is. Okay, so from a big American band to quite a big English band, I didn't actually realise, I'd never thought actually to look till I was sort of having a look to see what tracks you had, that they hail from Abingdon and Oxfordshire, and this is Radiohead. Yeah, that's correct, yeah, Radiohead. They are one of my all-time favourite bands. I love every single record they've ever put out, but in particular this track, Street Spirit, Fade Out, and was from the album The Benz and I just remember growing up my whole life my dad caning this record all the time and he had it on cassette and then he 
when CDs were a thing, he bought it on CD and he had both copies and then had it on vinyl kicking about as well. And it was, mm. I remember listening to it all the time and, and really liking every single track. There's definitely a few honourable mentions again that would have made it onto this list, but this particular track, which is the closing track on the album, is just amazing and it's always stuck with me with, with a very emotive tone and I love the guitar sound and the vocals, Tom York's vocals are just brilliant. He's mm. always he's probably one of my favourite vocalists, so yeah. Is the rest of the Benz in a similar kind of style? Because, I mean, it, it's it's a little bit of a departure from some of their earlier stuff. For example, Creep. Hmm, yeah, from that, from that first record. I mean, the whole of that album is very... I'd put it in the general rock category, if you had to put it in something. You know, it's very guitar-heavy, and it's, you know, distorted guitars and, and, and everything in between, and ballads. But this particular track at the end is almost like a ballad in itself, but with just slim down instrumentation it's almost quite naked in the way it sounds as a track you know the way it's produced and the way it's written it's a very raw song and that's why i love it so much it's it's nice to end an album with with such a beautiful track like this so yeah it's a it's a big inspiration for me and i would just very quickly mention as well that obviously johnny greenwood's the lead guitarist for radiohead is just a big idol of mine and his guitar playing on this is just amazing. There's a really cool video of Tom York and Johnny Greenwood performing this track on French TV. It must be in either in the late 90s or the early 2000s. Johnny Greenwood's on a 12-string and Tom York's on a 6-string and they're playing this song together and it just sounds amazing. <laughs> I want to hear it as I uh, slip away when I'm older. <laughs> it just sounds, it sounds amazing. It really puts me in a very, very nice place. So, yeah, it's, it's great.
radio head there. So we're going to have a, quite another big artist now. This is George Michael. Um, this is something that you've decided that you were going to swap mm. a, a track, a sort of a, a sort of the last moment. But um, yeah. why this one? This song, strangely enough, is a bit of a. I'd put it in the guilty pleasures category of, of my records. I've always really, really loved George Michael, and I really like Wham. I think it's because my mum was really, really into George Michael. And with this track in particular, Amazing, um, released in 2004, I think it was. I don't know the album too well, but this one song I always used to skip to on the CD in my mum's car because it was great. I loved it. I was just like a little kid just dancing around to it. <laughs> and I, I think the, the older I've got, I still really appreciate it. And it's a really good song. It's... Definitely, I've used the word departure quite a lot, but I'd, I'd say I'd say it one more time. This is definitely a departure from my usual listening, but mm. I really love it. I love the way it sounds, I love the way it's produced. It's that classic George Michael sounds, and it's it's a great track. Yeah, I really like it. It brings back good memories of of driving around with my mum blaring it and me singing along with her. So, <laughs> yeah, I, I take it she listened to a lot of eighties music, and so she was listening to uh, George Michael when. He was in Wham! with Andrew Ridgely. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, so, Wake Me Up Before You Go, Go, Young yeah, Guns, Go For It. Stuff. <laughs> and uh, and his, some of his early stuff, like Careless Whisper. Yeah, exactly. And um, yeah, obviously, Last Christmas by Wham! I remember, oh, of course. I remember connecting with Dots when I was quite young and being like, That's, that was put together by Wham! and George Michael. That's amazing. It's like my mm. favourite Christmas song ever now. But yeah, I feel like I just love George Michael and he's a funny character. He obviously had some ups and downs in his career, as any pop or rock star would do. But I, I don't know. He's, he's he's a really nice chap, and I feel like any interviews I've watched with him, he just he just seems like a really nice guy. And this track is just just a great bit of songwriting, a classic love song, but a bit shushed up. <laughs> if I had to give it a descriptive word like that, it just sounds really good. I'd I'd love to do it in front of everyone, karaoke, but I've, I've never had the guts to do it. So if I ever get around to it, this will be the one that's at the top of my list. You need one of those <laughs> beers first. Yeah, <laughs> maybe a few more than just the one, but yeah. <laughs>
Okay, I think you're going to have to explain this next track to me. Another British band, actually, which I hadn't heard of, who came around in about 2014, mm. Ulrika Spacek. Yeah. What's the title of the song and what does it mean? <laughs> <laughs> I don't really know too much about this track name-wise and what the meaning of the song is. It's called If the Wheels Are Coming Off, The Wheels Are Coming Off, which is a ridiculous name for a song. Sounds like they've given up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think so. But everything about this song, this has made it onto my list because just the way it's written and the way it's produced just sounds wicked. I absolutely love it. I love the clever use of time signature. Please don't ask me what time signature is <laughs> because I won't be able to tell you. Uh, but it's very off kilter time wise, and the guitars sound really, really big, and it's it's just a really good tune. And Aurica Space Egg are my favourite band currently, um, and I'm sure when I'm when I'm a lot older they'll still be up there. And this this is from a new record that came out. I think it was at the beginning of this year. Compact Trauma. The album is great, but these there's these tracks towards the end that are just you do feel like they're filler. But this one, when you're feeling like it's a bit filler, this one really brings everything up. And it's got an amazing music video that was made by the the, the front man himself and put together. And the song is just is great. There's so many great guitar parts in there. The drum sound is brilliant. There's a really nice reverb on the drums, which I just absolutely love. Obviously, with the with the track being so new, it's it's not something that's been around for ages, and um, it's made such an impression on me that it's made it all the way to you know this this list that I'm speaking to you about today, and um, it's brilliant. It's, it's a really well put together song. I really love when all the instruments come in together after the main drum part at the start, and it's just a really clever guitar outro at the end and just this really big synth part of the end which just sounds amazing sounds so gritty and if i had to say if i was doing my own releases music wise i'd have to not too shamefully say that i'd want to sound exactly the same as this <laughs> so yeah this is a if the wheels are coming off the wheels are coming off Interestingly, on uh, when you were talking about the last track to me, uh, you actually mentioned the word record. Um, ah, now, yeah, yeah. do you buy records or do you um, have a record collection? How do you get most of your music these days or is it all just online? I certainly do buy records, whether that's in the form of vinyl records or cassettes. I, I like to buy cassettes when I'm a bit tight on cash because some bands do that as a physical release mm. um, when they can't you know, afford to do vinyl and I can't afford to buy vinyl 
I like the way that you can get a physical release from an artist that doesn't cost the earth and it won't last forever, but it's still really special because you've supported the artist. Um, so yeah, I, I love I love the concepts of a record, you know, track one to track whatever, you know. I love Dark Side of the Moon, I love Pink Floyd, I love the way that album all sits together as one whole piece. And this whole process of choosing individual tracks was really difficult because I am someone that does enjoy listening to music in an album form end to end, not skipping a single track um, and listening to it as, you know, just, just, just as a one entire piece as it was designed to be listened to that way. Um, I really love having vinyl records and getting the artwork and getting gatefold records and looking at the specialist artwork and the inside and it, it's awesome records are just the best you know the whole the whole process buying it rushing home to listen to it although everything is digital and everyone listens to stuff on spotify like like i do you know i, I use spotify and i have my bluetooth headphones and i maybe consume music in a you could say a damaging way to the industry at the moment which is a really big topic obviously that we probably Hmm. can't go into too much detail about but i really feel like there is definitely still that scope there and still that lust there for people to go out and buy records and to enjoy music the the, the way it was intended to be listened to which is analog and vinyl and just it's just cool <laughs> absolutely <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah, yeah. It's, it's it's good that uh the younger generation is keeping that alive still yeah definitely um, yeah Obviously, I, I do wish it was <laughs> a little bit cheaper, but I think that's purely just because of the demand for, for, for pressing records at the moment is so great. And you've obviously got Adele and you know, the latest Arctic Monkeys album and everything else going on to vinyl, which I wouldn't want to be buying myself. And I'm, I'm not shaming people that would want to go out and buy that because it's great that people want to buy the latest releases on vinyl. That's absolutely brilliant. So, mm. yeah. So we come to your final track, which is from a French band called Air, mm-hmm. La Femme de Jean. So where did you hear this one? This is off what I believe is the 1998 album Moon Safari, which is absolutely amazing. So they've been going a while. They've been going for years, yeah. yeah. I, I myself don't know too much about them, but I know that I've listened to this one album from a very young age. It was in particular my mum and dad had this on CD. And they always used to play it in the car and they always used to play it at home on the hi-fi. And it was great. I, I love the way this... This is the opening track from the record. It's it's a slow burner. It, it it plays for a while. It's seven or eight minutes long and it's got the highs and lows of, of, of the track in there and it's got beautiful piano bits and the dynamic changes are, are, are brilliant. And I just think, in particular, the bass line and the, I think it's like a tremolo like electric piano part and the piano and the bass line is just it's just amazing and it's always stuck in my head particularly when I'm trying to make a track myself or I'm trying to think about how something should sound composition wise I always think of this track because I I just love the way it sounds it's it's brilliant I wouldn't say that I love the production it's not my I didn't choose this track because I love the way it sounds you know scientifically um, from a production perspective but just just the instrumentation is just amazing and the songwriting is brilliant and it is an instrumental track and the music does the talking.
so Johnny, you're sitting on a desert island listening to these records mm -hmm. on supposedly your wind-up gramophone, which was the original <laughs> premise of the programme. Yeah. And you have the complete works of Shakespeare and the Bible on your island for company. Okie dokes, yeah. I don't know whether you'd dip into either of those. I'd probably read the Shakespeare out of, out of, <laughs> out of boredom, I must say, which is... Probably not the right thing to say, and I, I don't think I touched the Bible. Mm -hmm. um, but this is after but, you've read your own book that you have. Aha, uh -huh, yeah. I must say that my, my book that I've chosen is quite unconventional. Because I do enjoy reading. I'm, I'm not a massive reader, but one thing I do love is cooking. And I feel like there'd be a big opportunity to do some cooking on a desert island if I had to, <laughs> uh, you know, um, scavenge for little insects and... Uh, coconuts i'm hoping there's coconuts on there because that's my, my favorite um but the book i've gone for is a cookbook delia's complete cookery course which complemented her tv show that she did for the bbc i think but the book's got a really distinctive cover it's delia smith on the front in a red suit and she's staring directly at the camera and she's saying this is my book all my recipes in here are great and you're going to love them of course it's a desert island i'm not going to be able to get you know dairy products and, and nice cuts of meat and, and fruit and vegetables to have but I feel like it's a nice book to read you can imagine you're reading some of to these get, things yeah. <laughs> imagine to the imagine flavors. and to also get inspired because yes. I feel like if I am going to you know, eat and survive on this desert island I'm going to have to cook up some pretty nutritious stuff to uh, keep me going so that's why it's on there um, yeah, that's a very good point yeah. do you think you'd be able to start your own fire do you think you'd better rub some sticks together and you'd have a go I'd find a way. I did. I, I I was a boy scout back in the day. I can find some some sticks and do that. I watched enough Bear Grylls and enough uh, ah. Ray Mears to, yes. to, to 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 do something productive, hopefully, to keep me going. But I thought of this book. It's almost quite a. It's a practical book, but it's also just a nostalgic book because I remember reading it in the kitchen with my mum or my mm. grandma in particular so much, and we used to cook everything from it for for Christmas dinners and soups for different occasions and whatnot and i'm not a massive cook but i i have cooked things from this book and i can say they are really really good and delia knows exactly what she's doing and it's also really funny obviously that i've ended up at a place in my life uh norwich that obviously delia smith's got a, a big connotation with, with you know i was going to say she's <laughs> she's uh yeah she's a celebrated local lass really yeah in that exactly way now. and she's obviously famous for for being a you know, part owner of norwich city football club and yeah she obviously, I uh, don't know what season, I'm not a Norwich fan myself, but she obviously had a little bit too much champagne one time and got on the microphone at Carrow Road and famously said, where are you? Come on, let's be having you, etc. And <laughs> it's just one of my favourite YouTube videos. What would your luxury item be on your island? This was an extremely tricky thing to choose, but I think after much deliberation with my, with my inner thoughts, I, I'd have to say... Straight up, it would be my acoustic guitar. It would be my Fender F35. It's something I jump out of bed and, and play in the morning if I have an idea or I just want to just... So you'd be, <laughs> not have to think about anything for, for five or ten minutes. So. You'd be playing it, you'd be writing songs in your head and... So, yeah, I was speaking to a colleague of mine today, Roz. You know, she said, no one's going to hear your songs if you write them. It's quite self-indulgent, but I write stuff for my own enjoyment and my own pleasure. Yeah. And I like the way it sounds. And if other people want to hear it, great. If other people get swept on this desert island and they do find handwritten lyrics on a bit of stone and they're like, who on earth did this? And I somehow found a way on this desert island to record these things, then that would be great and I'd love people to hear it. But I, I, I wouldn't be without my guitar ever in any situation. So um, it had to be acoustic, obviously. Yes. Because it just sounds beautiful as well. And this guitar is cheap and cheerful back in the day, but... It's old and it's got character and I love it and it, it always plays well. So that would be it for as long as the strings don't go rusty. I was about to say, to <laughs> which I can imagine you sort of, you know, going looking for twine, you know, trying to find some strong twine to replace the strings, especially the uh, I would the find a ones. way to keep it going, but I, it's it's my favourite instrument and I love it and it's it's who I am and it's what I love. So mm. that's why it's on the island with me. Yeah. Excellent. I think that's effectively like your Wilson, really, isn't it? Your um... it is, yeah, totally. I actually picked up that film the other day on DVD, so I'm going to watch that. I've never seen it before. Have you not? So mm -hmm. I, I'm, I'm looking forward to it. But I, I can imagine if I was on a 
a raft uh, floating around in the middle of the ocean and I lost that guitar, I would be absolutely gutted. Devastated, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So now we think about um, your favourite record and the idea that, again, you wind up gramophone, you've got your eight records on, on the beach. If you lost all of those but one, i.e. a wave came and swept seven of your records away and as you rushed to shore you realised that it had left one behind which one would you be hoping and praying that it had left for you? That is an extremely tough question and I, I think it would have to be record number one which would be Alter Ego, Tame Impala there's obviously all those other records and music that I grew up with and I grew up loving and learned to love more and less as I got older but with Tame Impala I I found this band myself. I learnt to love this record myself in my own time. And this record me and my partner are very fond of and it would I'd hope that every time I listen to it it would bring back really good memories of all the good times I've had in, in, in my early twenties and and whatnot. And I just I just love it. It's great. I'd be sat on does it on my very long scraggly hair, head banging. <laughs> <laughs> and, I can um, picture it now. Yeah, yeah, and I'd I'd be playing along on my acoustic guitar as long as I didn't lose it, or well, the strings were still on there and not rusting. So that's the record I'd really hoping I'd I'd be keeping hold of. So yeah, it's a shame this isn't television, and that while the final credits rolled, uh, we couldn't see an image of that. I I kind of see you yeah. almost like as a Neil character from the Young Ones, with your long hair and the guitar. Yeah, I feel like that's very much like me. Yeah, Johnny. Thank you for letting us hear your Desert Island Discs. Thanks a lot.